Greetings and peace, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I would like to start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. And with His mercy, we do what we do in these times of chaos that we're living in. Tonight, uh, to, to, today, excuse me, I have the honor and privilege of being joined by my dear sister of the Sufi path, Dr. Rahman Beckwith, and her new book, Falling in Love with God, and this relationship with the divine has been one of the best books that I have read. And I highly recommend it to all seekers of light that are watching this because these times that we're living in, it's just so much division, hatred, and chaos. We forget that there is that inner divine light and spark within each and every one of us. And I would really recommend those that are on this path, please check out this book and support our sister. And without further ado, I would like to say assalamu alaikum and greetings to our dear sister for joining us and giving us the teachings of this great uh, book and work that she has published. Welcome. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for doing what you do to spread good messages of wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, this comes to my first question, my dear sister, is what inspired you to write this book and how did you come about it? So I think what really inspired me is, um, obviously I had a Sufi Sheikh when I was young named Bala Mohayadeen, and yes. he was in Philadelphia and he taught me to search for God's love. And I always loved the stories of the saints like Rabi al and yes. I love Rumi's poetry and Hafiz. And so I realized that, you know, we could be like these people, you know, all of us have a heart that can find that love and that bliss and mm -hmm. to be in that paradise where God is real and present and mm -hmm. uh, just to be in love like that. And I realized that we're really looking in a lot of other places when that's right here for us. Yes, indeed. And you know what, when I was reading this book, this is great that you mentioned that because I myself have been on a similar path reading the works of Baba Muhayyuddin, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jalani, and all of these great saints and masters that have walked this earth with the Sufi path. And when I read this book, I put myself in the shoes of your character, Charity, and how Charity would go around and experience the, the things that she did in her life, experiencing disappointment from humanity, heartbreak from certain scenarios and situations, to realize that in this realm, we are kind of um, a, a faulted creature being in this realm and why we should surrender to a higher power in our life. So describing the character of charity, what inspired you to uh, create that character and to uh, did what she did in this book to discover that epiphany within herself? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. I feel like it's a combination of just experiences and people and um well first and foremost um i guess personally i do a lot of the practices that our character does such as waking up at 4 a.m to mm -hmm. do the zikr the meditation when i can do that um yes. and you know meditating on god's love and the poetry writing you know spiritual poetry myself and then reading it as often as i can um, so I've done a lot of that myself and seen how my heart can just melt, you know, just really like uh, be nourished by yes. these practices. So that's really part of it. The other part is the name charity itself came from that idea of also the goddess Kuan Yin, if you know of that compassionate being that is just giving like their whole existence is a charity, you know, it is mm. a benevolence. Um, yes. So I think those, those are some of the inspirations. Thank you so much. And when I was reading this book and I came across Charity's journey and what she was learning, it reminded me a lot of the Sufi concept of Kidmat, to live, live your life in service to others, like you have detailed about Kuan Yin. And which goes to my next question, my dear sister, is in these times that we are living in, what would you tell men and women that are struggling with finding love, finding relationships? And what would you recommend in today's society where there's a, a lack of commitment, lack of accountability? Uh, what would you recommend from your teachings and what charity has experienced in this book? Um, I, I have to also draw from, as you mentioned, Abdul Qadir Jalani, uh, who, I, who I love, love. I really studied his works 
uh, for a number of years. And what mm. he brings to me is that point of absolute divine unity, that mm -hmm. there is just one, there is one love. And so this idea that we put our hopes upon um, beings is mm -hmm. where we often let ourselves and we lead ourselves to be disappointed. You know, a being yes. is not capable. It's not all powerful. It's not all loving. Will not always be there for you, mm -hmm. um, but God will. You know, and so even in the yes. book, we see Charity has a bird just land on her on her balcony, but she feels that's from God. So you'll mm -hmm. never be in in deficiency for love if you're looking in the right places. When you're looking to God as opposed to, you know, someone else's you know, whim, whether they'll love you or not that day, right? It's about God always showing up for you and you just showing up to be there with that, to receive that. Thank you, my dear sister. And this reminds me of a story that my mother always tells me is that uh, you have a mother that loves uh, her child and she will always find ways to cover up their faults and make sure that the, the child is always being nourished, protected and cared for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, loves his creation 70 times more than a mother's love. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point that you have pointed out in terms of surrendering to the divine. And not, not only what Islam teaches us, but any path that I have seen in my life, it all teaches you to submit to the divine. Which goes to my next question, dear sister, is tell me who Dr. Rahman Beckwith is and how did you become who you are today in terms of your teaching and your knowing and what you're doing in your life. I want to learn about you as well. Sure. And if I may also, um, just to, back to that question you were speaking of, you know, that unending, uh, unconditional love. I forgot to mention, um, you know, because Bawa was a big part of who I am since I was born in the Sufi Center, you know, in, in Philadelphia, yes. there was a book that he wrote, which I referenced in my book. It's called The Book of God's Love. Mm -hmm. And the reason I mentioned that is because, as you said, with relationships, there's a lot of uh, self-love and uh, self-need you know, need and desire. And Bawa was saying in that book that the only real love is this love born of compassion and this grace. And so when you're in a relationship, mm -hmm. um, if you can just be with humans as that, you know, that energy of, of um, you know, that saintly divine energy of just being present and showing up as a grace, then yes. I think you won't be disappointed and neither will they. So that's <laughs> kind of the work that I think is there for us to do around relationships. But um, yeah, so answering who I am. Okay, so yes, I, I did grow up, you know, in this um, Sufi community and I'm so appreciative mm. that I learned the zikr, like the breathing meditation where we say la ilaha illallah and we are just purifying and saying that, you know, there's no reality except for God. And I, that has been really mm. a crucial practice for me for many years. So that was foundational. Um, and then I actually, you know, I grew up, I went to Princeton University and graduated. And, you know, I have several uh, higher degrees in psychology and spirituality. Um, and I just, during the pandemic, I really was able to actually have a lot of online classes where I've been teaching people to meditate, people all over the world, you know, London and Canada, and even Australia. Mm. So, so I'm glad to be able to offer this gift. And also, of course, I have many, you know, MP3s and online things people can do on their own to sort of find that kingdom, like that peace within. That's what I really want to give to the world, that, that love and harmony that comes from developing your sovereignty and your divine inner presence. So that's sort of who I am. <laughs> Yes, that, thank you so much. And it's it's such an honor and privilege to be able to speak to you and learn from you in times such as these where there isn't that much love and light going around. And we need people like you and beings like yourself who are, are the light of the world and are doing what they're doing to uphold uh, basically the existence of humanity at this point. Which goes to my next question, my dear sister. How did growing up as a child of Bawa and also falling in love with divine help you navigate through the Western lifestyle here in terms of uh, growing up in this country. And there's this uh, aspect of egoism, individualism, and other, other stuff, which kind of sets you apart from everybody else. But in reality, human beings like the Baba Fellowship and other Sufi orders or any organization that you see, it's us coming together as one to exemplify Allah Allah as one, but also 
to represent what we are as human beings. So how did growing up in Wawa help you navigate through the Western lifestyle? Oh, that's a great question. I think something that I've always come back to is that foundation of that compassion and that love that Bala showed. Um, and I was very young when he was alive, but that that energy lives on in the in the community. So that yes. foundational love, I think, <clears throat> taught me that everything else in the world is really secondary to mm -hmm. having good qualities like peace and gratitude, you know, appreciation, thanking God. Um, trusting in God, you know, mm -hmm. these were just foundational. So later I did learn things like, you know, positive thinking and law of attraction. And I really, I, you know, I love to be able to think positively and all that. But again, yes. the foundation is like to be in the presence of God and peace and harmony and all of that. So I think that was important to in navigating life in general. Um, and mm -hmm. also I forgot to mention, like I said, you know, on my website, I have a journal for appreciation because I used to just write you know gratitude and try to have a good state you know be in a good state I think that's what we overlook in society um, yes. in a lot of countries not I've also lived in you know Turkey and other places so I think being in a good state is foundational to everything you want to do and mm -hmm. that is um, yeah I think that's how it helped me in my life to grow up in a spiritual center yeah that is beautiful. And for those the viewers that are listening, uh, all of the services and works of Dr. Rahman Beckwith, I will put in the description below. And I, it goes to my next question is, those individuals that I have come across in this country, my dear sister, who are, let's say, traumatized in a way, they experience some kind of a trauma in their youth where they're unable to sustain any kind of relationship, some fall into the traps of hypersexuality, they fall into other traps, which kind of binds them in this chaotic realm that we're in and that this aspect of continuous chaos where they're unable to find any stability or peace within their thinking how does surrendering to the divine can help one overcome something like that especially in a land like this where something those things are common definitely and um you know obviously people need to seek out their own um clinical treatment um here i'll just speak very generally two things yes. that I think can be helpful, but, um, you know, everyone's doing the best that they can. And some people might be caught in sort of a darkness and just have to work their way out of that. I think some really helpful tools might be if one could spend time, you know, in nature or with wise people, or even, you know, listening to us on YouTube, the viewers of your channel, I'm sure are very enlightened because they're already looking for this deeper wisdom. Um, and actually I was watching one of your vid videos yesterday and you were talking about the need to clear the heart of any darkness and any negative divisiveness or thoughts. And I love that because you were saying like in times like these, we can't afford to you know, waste time or have this within us or be divisive like this. It was just a great message, very potent. So I think that that's what I would encourage people to do is really try to let go and to clear their hearts and to say, you know, God had a bigger picture in mind when these bad things happened. And I want to mm -hmm. understand that. I want to have the wisdom to find peace and, you know, contentment where I am right now and not look at the past and complain or be afraid about the future, but just be with God right now and be okay and be thankful and really try to cultivate that like a practice. Like I said, journaling or praying regularly, you know, really like a muscle, making yourself this spiritual warrior who is just in a state that is admirable and happy and beautiful and peaceful or whatever you can do. Thank you so much, my dear sister. And that's absolutely right, because even with uh, Bawa's teachings that I'm, I'm always inspired by, he always tells you to make sure your heart, your kalb is always clear and your heart is connected to the creator. And that always inspired me when I see the Sufi symbol. It has the heart with the wings on it. And I, I dream about that all the time where I'm in these uh, beautiful castles and I see these symbols with the hearts flying around me. And that's Alhamdulillah. I'm truly grateful for the path that I walk and the great uh, sisters like yourself and brothers that come into my life to teach me and guide me as we are all a reflection of each other in many manifestations, walking each other home. And you are doing absolutely wonderful work, which goes to my next question, Dr. Rahman, is if today was your last day on earth, 
what would you tell the people that love you, the ones that you love, the Bawa community, Mm -hmm. uh, those men and women out there that are spiritually struggling in this country, not only here, but all over the world to find fulfillment, to find peace? Mm -hmm. What what would you say? That's that's my next question. Wow. So I guess it would be the message that was in this book that there is love for them and that even if a physical being is going that that Mm -hmm. love is eternal so that my love is still going to be there showing up you know in a rose in a garden maybe a bush that I planted years ago and then I've passed away but that rose will still bloom so you'll Mm -hmm. find that love eternally and um, so I would tell them probably to read the book and then look for me in the signs of God's love around if they miss me and look, look anyway, because everybody needs God's love to nourish them. So I probably, yeah, I'd say look for the love everywhere. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And this, this reminds me a lot of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jalani and Rabia Al Basri. When Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jalani was about to pass away, he had all of his uh, children assembled before him. And he would say, the greatest advice that I can give you in my experience in my life is always trust God. And that's all he told them is always trust God's will. And everything in your life will go accordingly through the good and bad times as it shapes you to who you're meant to be. And that is absolutely wonderful. What you have said is that you have to find that connection. Something you have planted today will bloom into something else tomorrow. And that's the greatest gift that not only you can give yourself but to humanity and i thank you dearly for that which goes to my next question is how how has surrendering to the divine changed your life and how has it changed your outlook on let's say we're living in times where one race gets put against other there's a one political class gets put against other there's the us versus them so how did surrendering to the divine eliminate all those barriers for you Yes, that it, it is a hard time right now. And we look at these injustices and things happening. And when we look, sometimes we don't see the bigger picture. So I'm always trying to, to inquire and have that dialogue with God about, you know, what is what's going on here? What what's really going on? And part mm-hmm. of what comes to me in those instances is that everyone is in God's care, in God's mm-hmm. mercy. So every, you know, race and there, God has all of it in his control. And so not to be as thrown off um, by some of the things and uh, to have compassion because easily in the news we can um, sort of demonize one side or the other side and it's more about maybe trying to have an open heart to understand people are coming from different histories and uh, to just have that compassion and grace for situations that seem very polarized or that you'd want to make judgments but maybe you should um, have more grace and patience with that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And I thank you for that, because right now we do need times of patience and the aspect of sabr, doing the zikrs, doing your spiritual practices and having the, the discipline to know what is it that I need to fix in my life and make the game plan to work towards that. Because once you're, the intention is there, then you could be in even in an impossible situation. Once you make your heart set about a certain scenario, then you will get out of it. And I, and I thank you for that, which, which goes to my next question. In Sufism, as I, I have a, a, the initiation with the Murid Tariqa, with Naqshbandi, with Fatimiya. So I always learned in the Sufi practices that your ego must submit to a guide. You must submit to a sheikh, whether it's Bawa or any other order that you're in. What would you tell the people here in Western society that are falling into this trap of not needing each other in times where we really need each other the most. Mm -hmm. What would you advise from your perspective as a female Sufi to submitting to somebody who help you walk home and help you get to the destination you're meant to? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say definitely, you know, like I said, seek wisdom, whether they're ancients who wrote it, like you said, Rabia Ladawiya, she wrote very pure a guidance about just having that one love for God and not being distracted by the world. And there are many, you know, saints and mystics of many traditions. So, um, you know, I think you can find this in a lot of places, find what your, your soul needs for your particular journey. Mm-hmm. And I would say always what Bawa taught us, right, Allah, was to use your wisdom. 
use your wisdom. So even yes. if you have a teacher and you respect them, you know, take what is good from that and use your wisdom for your own guidance. Um, and I love what you said, that story about Abdul Qadir Jalani Radilov and um, his guidance, you know, that it's just Allah, right? It's just God. So that's really your teacher. <laughs> ultimately that's who you want guidance from and the rest will just come as your you know as proxies to that one teacher which is your true guide right yeah. that's true that is absolutely true and this goes to my next question i was reading one of bawa's um uh, lectures and transcription of that lecture and it's called uh, being a god man or uh, you finding that god within yourself so what would you advise in terms of finding that divinity within yourself while well, we're looking over here, we're looking here, all the Sufi teachings or even the Islamic esoteric teachings, they teach us that you must find the divine within your own self and the divine can't come to you and teach you whether it's uh, teaching through you, you know, as my sister teaching me, giving me guidance, giving guidance to the viewers. How would you identify finding that oneness and that peace within yourself while we're looking over here and over there, but don't realize that the greatest treasure in this universe was within you the whole time. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. And I love that you come to the point of it to find that within and not necessarily look for um, outer divine representations, but to definitely, you know, do that, but also find it within. Um, yes, so yes. I think that I think what you said earlier was really important for that, the idea that we have to sort of slay the ego or diminish that. And so, like mm. I said, I love the zikr, just la ilaha illallah, breathing out the ego and the thoughts and the emotions and breathing in God and taking time to do that simple zikr, that meditation has helped me because you start to see yourself and you see that you're carrying all of these things and you just breathe them out and make space for that God, you know, that divine silence and presence and the vastness within because i think then within you you have everything and um yeah I, you get to realize that divine um presence so i don't know i'm sorry i think was your question how do we do it or i i missed yeah so it was about like um finding the, the divine within yourself where we get lost thinking that god is something mm -hmm. that's external from us and once you realize that you have so much peace in your life, knowing mm -hmm. all the things that I'm meant to do, people that I'm meant to see, places that I'm meant to go, everything in this life is an exquisite, sublime plan of the creator. And it, there, there, are, there are no accidents. Everything happens the way that it was supposed to. So how does one kind of find that peace and balance within oneself from your perspective, mm -hmm. from the divine feminine Sufi perspective? Mm -hmm. I think actually you're touching on something that I'm just, I'm still working on and I've been working on it, but always uh, there's a, there's a verse in Surah Al-Rahman in the Quran. Yes. It says everything, everything will finish, will be done, will perish, you know, on the earth, except uh, the Lord full of majesty, bounty and honor. Mm -hmm. And this verse comes to me because I try to see God, like everything else is not, I'm not seeing it for the material thing that it is. I'm seeing God in it. And so yes. I think when people can start to see the divine in the things that happen in their own actions, their own qualities, when they can see the grace in someone else, the kindness, the good qualities, like you start to just see God more frequently, sort of like our character was doing. And I think yes. once you get to that state of like a HUD, like that just there's the one, just God, then it becomes a different, universe for you a different world and that's really mm. i think that's what I'm, I'm reaching towards myself um so more than being just in love it's being in oneness you know that you and i are just a reflection of that same quality to share and to teach and indeed it's, so that everywhere is just a face of god even someone like denying you or turning away from you is god saving you from something and being gracious so everything is god's grace you know so i think that's home to the law yeah alhamdulillah that 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 is beautiful and you are absolutely spot on that sometimes we let the disappoint disappointments of life kind of get the best of us and bring us down in terms of our morale and losing faith in the creator but we realize that everything has a sublime plan associated with it just like with uh, the brothers of yusuf alayhi salam who threw him down the well and down the road it was all 
working out accordingly where he was going to end up going to Egypt and then end up seeing his family again in the future and then offering mercy and forgiveness to them in return. And that is Allah's plan for all of our lives. Which goes to my next question, my dear sister, is the importance of having a spiritual discipline and practice in today's time where we're constantly being bombarded by information. It's um, draining our energy etherically, where they all want us to think about war and destruction at the same time, feeding this aggregate, this demonic uh, aggregate of darkness. How do you break free from that and just stay focused and centered on a spiritual discipline? That is a great and very um, appropriate question for this time. So I definitely tell my students that in my meditation classes, and um, I, I just mentioned that you know limiting the the influence of those of those media sources or conversations is good if you can. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, using wisdom so that you're not charged by the information, so that you're yes, not like yes. angry or blaming or. Um, but you rather can see like, okay, you know, this is what's happening and have that perspective. Um, and of course, having that practice, you know, making it a commitment, like the character, you know, in the book, she's, she's deciding to have a relationship with God. And yes. to her, that means, you know, falling in love and doing it a certain way. Um, but there are so many ways you can um, do a morning meditation. You can do a positive journaling of like what you're grateful to God for that day mm -hmm. you can do um, a walk in nature where you just breathe and you reflect you know I mean it's not it doesn't have to be anything <clears throat> in particular but just take time to connect your soul if you want to uh, to your to your creator just to be present you know that's um, it's so overlooked in this in this age it's it's amazing how people will spend so much time on things that are so external and then like they don't have they don't cultivate their soul and it's like how could you not do that? You know, it's so <laughs> crucial. It's so pivotal. It makes you more beautiful. Like you're going and doing these things to become better in the world when mm. this is really the treasure, like the answer to all of the prosperity and the peace and the love that you want, you know, is your own spiritual, like you said, the, the energy body, the, the, what you cultivate within your own state is yes. your treasure, right? So yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely it. And I thank you very dearly for that. I remember back in 2019, fall of 2019, I went on a uh, Sufi pilgrimage, as you can say, to Pakistan, my home country. And I went to all of the Sufi shrines and saints in Islamabad, in Rawalpindi, in Karachi, in Lahore, and the border regions of India and Pakistan, where a lot of the great Sufi masters and saints lived. And the energy that I felt in those places was it was something that was not of this world. As I sat there and I meditated and I spoke with a lot of the fakirs because a lot, a lot of the Sufis, I really love this about them. He could be a CEO or he could be in a high position, but every time you ask him, who are you? He would just say, I'm a fakir, that uh, I don't own anything in this world. So what would you advise brothers and sisters of the path, Sister Rahman, that are let's say, seeking love, seeking relationships, they're seeking some kind of a material gain to find happiness. What, what would you tell those people? Is that where the happiness is? Or how do you, how, in what other ways can those on the path find happiness? Um, I, think, I think it's a great question because it is important to acknowledge the material needs of the body. You know, we are elemental. And um, by the way, traveling is a great spiritual pilgrimage practice, I think. So if the world opens and people have any means, I think there is a definitely an, you know, an experience to be had in, in spiritual places. So I, I definitely love that. So to acknowledge that elemental need um, in various ways um, is I think important. So it's a good question. Um, so, so, okay, from the point of, again, back to the Quran, uh, God says, uh, if you're thankful, I give you more, I'll give you more. So there's that and combining that with what I know of the positive thinking law of attraction. Um, I would say, you know, and I'm talking to Solomon here, right? So the king of, you know, the greatest kingdom, may God give you that, you know, of the prophets, this, the abundance of that. And, you know, inshallah, may you have, you know, even greater in the heavens and the earth, because that is, um, I think that's there for us. But the way that people go about getting it is to feel this lack and feel this desire. <clears throat> These vibrations are not productive. 
And we, people don't know that if you say, if you say, God, thank you for what you've given me. I'm so thankful. You know, this is the recipe for getting more. So the mm -hmm. law of attraction also says the same thing. You want to be positive and, you know, in a good state. And so if you want something like, you know, partners or abundance or whatever it is that you think that you want in the world, you need to be in the state that, that brings that, right? You can't just like, you know, people will make these vision boards and say, I put a picture of a car and I put a beautiful spouse in it. And then they go back to their day and they're like angry or sad or, you know, mm. overwhelmed. And these are not the vibrations that bring a happy relationship or, you know, this is why our character Charity, she cultivated uh, love. And I'm not going to say how the story goes, but that is what you would do to bring love in other forms like people mm -hmm. or um, good job opportunities or um, marriages or whatever it is, or, you know, whatever it is that you think you're trying to manifest. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is absolutely beautiful. It's about the inner reality and inner frequency that you create that will manifest your external reality. And that is absolutely beautiful, my dear sister. And that goes to my, my next question is uh, the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that heaven lies at the feet of your mother and the aspect of the divine feminine and honoring and uplifting the divine feminine. What would you tell the men in this country who have kind of, uh, you know, myself being from that divine masculine point of view, what would you tell the men in this country who have uh, failed to protect their women? There's so much domestic abuse. These women are degraded in these different industries and portrayed in a certain way, as we see in different forms of entertainment that's out there, which is not really entertainment, that's degradation of the character of the feminine, what would you tell the males in this country of what they need to do to protect their women as Islam teaches mm -hmm. us and, you know, from yourself, from the divine feminine perspective? Well, thank you. That's a beautiful question again. And I think as you always, you know, mention, you're calling me a sister to really believe that people are our sisters and our mothers and our grandmothers and our daughters and yes. to really genuinely and also our brothers and our fathers you know to genuinely mm. treat human beings as human beings uh, to have compassion and understanding for them and try not to judge them um, and also I love the metaphor as you said that divine feminine at the feet of the mother um, mm. to take that within and say what are the qualities of a divine feminine uh, you know Bawa himself when he he would be so gracious and feed people, be compassionate and be patient. Mm. And that's a very feminine quality. So even if the men uh, develop, you know, patience and kindness and, uh, you know, overcome their anger, you know, that is, I think, worshiping at the feet of the divine mother, as you, as you mentioned. So just doing, it's interesting how the answer comes back to all of this. How do you manifest? How do you treat people better? It's all coming back to like, just creating your inner state and and you know perfecting that and and meditating and connecting to god and that's really how you do these other outer things too thank you my dear sister and that is absolutely how it is it's all about finding that healing and oneness within yourself where it, it reminds me of every time neo goes to the oracle in the matrix and she always doesn't she doesn't tell him anything she always points to the sign above the door that says know thyself, which is know thyself, know thy Lord, know thy Lord, know thyself, mm -hmm. which goes to my next question, Sister Rahman, is those women here in America, let's say, that are intrigued by Sufism, I have seen various scenarios where, let's say, they ended up in a fake Sufi group, and the leader probably ended up taking advantage of them in some way, uh, you know, if you know what I mean, and how, how would you advise the women here who are truly seeking that path? to be able to identify the correct teacher, the correct guide, the correct group. So what, what advice would you tell the women here, men, men and women alike, on how to identify what is true and what is being portrayed as falsehood to take advantage of them? That's a great question. And, and I'm so, so thankful that I was sort of born into an order where that wasn't an issue. Um, you know, Bawa had the highest standards of like the Kutubiyat that he was bringing to us, but um, I do know of such things. And so I have a subtle answer, which is um, actually maybe people wouldn't think of, and then a more practical answer. So the subtle answer is that when we talk about things like, again, the law of attraction and how we are manifesting and creating from our energy, mm -hmm. we want to be as pure as we can. 
So <clears> if we are someone who is, you know, watching these, you know, romantic TV shows and things that are too prevalent, you know, I, in my opinion, in society and all of this, you know, content that is filling our energy field up with that. And yes. we are carrying that. And then we go into a spiritual place. We still have what we've created, the, the energies that are working in our bodies. So there's a, there's a point where you have to do the best you can to personally clear yourself and to not attract situations that might be difficult. But then mm. again, you know, I, we can't blame people for being where they are and you do the best that you can. Um, perhaps finding feminine, you know, like the ajab of having like a feminine sohbet, like spiritual discussion group or yes, having um, yes. something just using also practicality. Like, do you feel something's off, <laughs> you know, when you're in this like all male room and everyone's chanting, does that feel like, does that feel right? And even if it feels right, is the adab suggesting that that is where you should be, you know, in your life right now? So, so it's kind of multi-leveled, but it is, it's hard to know. Um, spirituality is so uh, multifaceted that it's hard to know, you know, who to listen to. So again, using your wisdom and asking God for a teacher. That, that no, never that's, that's, right. absol <laughs> that's absolutely spot on, my dear sister. And that, that reminds me of a scenario that I was in, let's say going six months back, where there was somebody that was asking me for consultation. And I just, as a friend, it was only from a friend to friend basis, where you could call up a friend and ask advice. And I told this friend that when somebody tells you who they are, you, you best believe them. And the second thing that I told them is always follow the intuition of your heart. Because if your heart tells you, just like how you have beautifully stated in the manner that you have, is that your heart will always tell you if someone or something does not feel right. Mm -hmm. If it's not right, they, there will be a, a vibe that is not connecting. Mm -hmm. Or if there is an intention that they have, which is not beneficial to you, you will identify that. And I, and, I, and I thank you so much. And, you know, in, in today's society, it goes to my next question, where we have divine love, our love with Allah, the creator. And also we have a love with our family, love with our siblings, love with those that are close to us. But also it comes to the aspect of Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which is Rahman is the feminine and the Rahim is the masculine that androgynous energy of the creator becoming one, how he, it's even exemplified in the Matrix movie with Neo and Trinity, that but he, neither of them could become the one unless they had each other. Mm -hmm. So in today's society, let's say, where even in the Islamic communities, I have seen this recently, where people are afraid to, let's say, not commit, not marry, because your faith is not complete unless you marry your opposite half. So what would you advise the men and women because I've seen it here in my local mosque too. What would you advise them to identify between what is true love between a man and a woman and what is just a, a lust that you're having? So the difference between the shaitan, which is tempting you with lust, or the true love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's telling you or putting true love in your heart for the opposite, man for a woman or woman for a man in your divine feminine perspective. That is such a great question. And it is really... Uh, it's subtle. It's really subtle. So I think it's great that we'll go over that. And before I do, I just, one thing I want to throw in there, and this may be a rare case or for certain people in certain periods of their life, there is, you know, no shame in being like a Rabbi Aladawiya. If you really want to pray and devote yourself, you know, she was single and they tried to get her married and she wouldn't get married, but that's mm -hmm. a rare case perhaps because most people have that um, need for more than just God. And in, mm -hmm. in a love, but to have, you know, people and that's fine. So the question of how to sense, obviously, you know, if you have a good process, like I said, praying to God for a teacher, um, a spiritual teacher, praying to God for the proper mate at the proper time, you know, um, mm -hmm. starting with that. And then if you have, you know, good people in your community that you trust or a, a process that's healthy, I think the, the, the thing that's subtle is people fall into sort of like a hell where they're burning. And that's yes. kind of when you know that something's off. What, it might be nice, like burning with desire and burning with you know, jealousy or burning with intention. Like the burning itself, I think is the differentiation point where you realize, hey, I'm kind of in a hell. <laughs> Maybe I should try to like, 
pray about this and do the istikara, like asking God, is this a good relationship yes, or yes. not? Like just make it or don't make it. But I don't want to be in hell for like, you know, dating phases where it goes on and on. And I just don't know. And I'm, you know, because I think in the East, uh, the Western culture here, we do have sometimes different approaches that can um, allow for different experiences, you know. So you want to not let yourself fall into a lower state because you're, again, your spirituality is is everything it's your it's your currency it's your wealth it's your abundance and you don't want to lose that to like a, a process of discerning a partner uh, because you've lost all your thoughts and your emotions and your energy going to that process when mm -hmm. you have a soul's purpose a life to live your work to do your spiritual path your journey and all of that will bring the proper um people colleagues you know uh, partners friends family so I, I firmly believe that will be the way to go about it Thank you, my beautiful sister. That is absolutely the truth. And you are exemplifying that truth in your heart and in your expression with everything that you have said. And that, that goes to my, my next question is, right now, let's say the, the generation that's growing up right now, they have the COVID situation that they had to deal with, there's crime, there's drugs, inflation, so much uncertainty in their futures. And there's so much fear and hopeless, hopelessness that's going around. From your perspective of the divine feminine, what would you advise them in terms of how charity surrendered herself to God and found peace through God's love? And I, I, I love this book and I really cherish the teachings that you have provided to humanity. And I would ask you, my dear sister, is what would you tell the generation, not only in this greater Philadelphia area, but the world as a whole, that everywhere we see this implosion of lawlessness, crime, and debauchery and degeneration, what would you advise them? I, yeah, I think it is, it's an intense, intense time. And while I see the beauty and the light, you know, of people helping each other in such ways during the pandemic that we're just so, you know, melting of the heart to see this, right? You see it and yes. you're just, your heart is so full. Uh, there is the other side of it. So I definitely think that people being able to see that there are, you know, again, material benefits of faith very often. Again, you know, King Solomon, God bless him, um, <laughs> upon him. You know, there are cases, many, many cases where if you just trust that God will make your money might be inflating, but you might find something like at the store the other day, I found something like 90% off on a sale and it was like a lovely sweater. And I thought, wow, even with inflation, this is like such a good, you know, it was just such, you know, God evened it so easily, you know, so you don't have to trust in things like the money or the, um, you know, the government that you live under, you know, you live under God that's superior to any system. So that mm -hmm. will take care of you if you make that your ruling power. And you say, God, you, you're in charge of my finances. God, you're in charge of if I marry or who I marry or when I marry. God, you're, this is, you know, I belong to you. So yes, yes. you have to take care of me. You know, then God <clears throat> will take care of you. And you just have to sort of try to go with the flow because that is <laughs> mysterious, right? God works in these mysterious ways. But, but I think faith yields real material rewards. So we don't mm -hmm. want to have people trusting in the world and being mm. disappointed and scared and um, let them be optimistic because, you know, God is here, so. Yeah, that, that is absolutely beautiful. And that that is true because once you surrender to the divine and realize that some, some things or some circumstances in your life, there are things that you have control over, but there are also other scenarios which you have no control over. So you must realize who you are, what you stand for, what capability you have and when is it when you submit to a higher power to let them guide you through the rough waters, through the rough seas until your boat starts sailing in calm waters with full sails. And that's, that's the beauty of this human journey, my dear sister. And um, it's been such an honor and privilege speaking with you. And I, I would like to ask you, uh, what else would you like to address from your teachings and from the form of charity's character? Something that I have failed to ask you, uh, anything that you would like to address? Well, your questions have been so just so great and so fun to uh, to go through and I also just want to confirm what you were saying about 
um, I, you know, there's always that question of, oh, should I just do nothing and be inactive? And I was, you know, of course, not implying that because if you put your trust in God and God tells you to go to a different place or do something differently, obviously you need to be in, in that relationship, doing that um, appropriate mm -hmm. action. So that is definitely, you know, I agree with you on that, uh, that there's action involved. So uh, let's see from the book. I don't know. I think we've touched so many good points about the book. Um, I don't know. One thing I did, I have another book, a book. I wanted to read this poem because I just, it just makes my heart melt. So this is a poetry book I had written before, A Gift of Joy. But right. um, I just, I love God and I love this, this sort of dialogue we had. Uh, so if people ever dialogue with God, they can sort of, they can have fun with that. So one day I was driving and I, I was telling God, um, God, I write lots of poems to you for you and about you. When are you going to write a love poem for me? And God said, everything is a love poem for you. So That's beautiful. I, yeah. I hummed a little loud. Yeah. And that, yeah. that is basically true of how God sustains us. And it reminds me of a story from a, a village in Pakistan where there was a, a rich man. He was a rich businessman and he had to get a heart surgery. And he was in the hospital for about seven to eight days. And they came and of course, over there, there is no concept of medical insurance. So there was a big bill that he had to pay for seven to eight days of care, food, shelter, the services of the doctors and medical procedures, everything. And he cried. And when he looked at the bill, he started crying. And uh, the, the doctor asked, what's wrong, old man? You know, we can help you. We can help lower the bill if something is not working out for you. We can, we have charities that are set up like the Islamic Foundations or the ED Foundation. They have all these different services there that help people. And he said, no, I'm not crying because of the bill. He said, God has provided me enough money where I can pay this bill 10 times over. He said, I'm, I'm thanking the mercy of the Lord who all the way till my old age, he took care of my heart and he took care of my life and provided for me, but he never gave me any bill. Uh, or, you know, basically he did everything for free for, for love, making sure I was loved, protected and provided for. And that is absolutely the, the best, best advice that you have shared in that poem. And for those that are listening for the services and all your publications and everything that you do, I will provide all the links in the description below. So all those that are watching my channel, uh, you can support Dr. Rahman Beckwith and her work. And also I give permission for her YouTube channel to download this video off of my channel and upload and distribute wherever you wish. So with that, my dear sister, do you have any closing remarks or closing thoughts for the audience? Anything else that you would like to address or put out there that I have uh, failed to ask you? Hmm. I, nothing is coming to me at this time. This is very complete, um, very nice. Uh, so, but perhaps, you know, you know, perhaps I could interview you for my channel sometime because I feel like the discussion could definitely go on and on in beautiful ways. So, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. And again, assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace and love be with all of you and your families during this time. And please check out Dr. Rahman and her work and all the services that she offers. And yeah, until next time, thank you so much. Thank you.